Do you remember what I spoke on three Sundays ago? Probably not. If your memory is like mine, it's kind of feeble. But uh, we tried to speak on the subject of the mind of Christ. Let this mind be in you. Which also was in Christ Jesus. And I haven't really been able to get away from that thought a whole lot. And I really don't want to. The more I delve into this, the more I understand why we need that. Why do I need to think like Christ? Why do I need to feel like Christ feels? Why do I need to react like Christ reacts? There's lots of good reasons. Number one, because he tells us to be holy as he is holy. Does he not? In 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 13 through 19, I believe it is. If you want to turn there, I'll read that for a scripture tonight. And then I'd like to review just, to, just briefly what I said Sunday and then give you at least two or three more attitudes of the mind of Christ that I'd like us to think about. 1 Peter 1, chapter 13, Wherefore, gird up the loins of your mind, be sober, and hope to the end for the grace that is to be brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, not fashioning yourselves according to the former lust in your ignorance, but as he, who hath, as he which hath called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation. Because it is written, Be ye holy, for I am holy. And if you call on the Father, who without respect of persons judgeth according to every man's work, Pass the time of your sojourning here in fear. In other words, if we're going to be judged by what we do and how we act, it's a, it's, a, it's a matter of serious contemplation. Pass your time of sojourning here in fear. Not tormenting fear, but a, a consciousness and a reverence and an awe. And somewhere down in the in, inner recesses of our being, a, a sense that I don't want to miss it. I wouldn't do anything to displease him. I don't do anything that would cause me to be cast out. Do you? No, we shouldn't. For as much as you know that you were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers, but you were redeemed with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. Father, we thank you tonight for your word. We pray you'll help us tonight in a few moments here to, to gather some thoughts together and help us to think about these things and meditate on them, Lord, in the days ahead and pray about it, to pray about the mind of Christ. Lord, I want to think like you think. I want to feel about the gospel and about God and about people the way you feel about them. Father, if I don't, I'm not going to be like you. And we're to emulate our Savior. We're to be transformed into the image of Christ. We're to be holy as He is holy, Father. And the only way we can do that is have right thoughts and right concepts, right attitudes. Lord, touch us tonight, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's review a little bit. The four minds that I talked about Sunday three weeks ago, the first mind was a servant's mind, a submissive mind, a humble mind. What benefit would it be to have a submissive mind? When God has told us right here in our passage tonight, as obedient children. Is it easy to be obedient when your mind wants to rebel? When your heart wants to go another direction? When you're thinking that this is not what I want to do, I want to do something? Is it easy to obey when there, that kind of attitude prevails? Friend, we need the mind of Christ so that we can have it settled in our heart. Whatever God wants, I want. Wherever God leads, I go. Whatever God says, I believe it and I intend to do it by his help and grace. Isn't that though submissive? Jesus never wavered in his submission to the Father's will. He never wavered in anything, didn't want anything else. Didn't look for anything else. Wouldn't that be wonderful if everybody in the church would not want nothing but what the Father wants for us and to do with us? I tell you, there'd be a great benefit in having that submissive mind when it comes to finding scriptures where it tells us different things that we need to do and things we need to not do. Many people struggle over that. 
Many people get in, in deep spiritual trouble because they see things in the scripture that are forbidden, but they want to do it anyway. They go ahead and do it anyway. I want a submissive mind. And the reason I want a submissive mind is so I can obey him with a pure heart. The second mind I talked about was a sacrificial mind. A spirit of self-denial, sacrifice, looking on the things of others, looking at the needs of others. How much would that kind of spirit help you to be a cheerful giver? Oh, yeah, I give my tithe to the church. <laughs> yeah. Goody, goody, goody. You've met your minimum requirements. That's the minimum requirement. But isn't it wonderful to know that you rejoice, that your tithes are in? Wherever he's lead, led you to give an offering, you've given it. Whatever he's asked of you, you've done it. This spirit of self-denial, it's not about me and it's not about you. And as soon as we figure that out, we might want the mind of Christ. That's, that is sacrificial. You know, uh, it would make us more diligent to be at our post even. When it comes to serving, not just giving of our, our material things, but when it comes to giving of our time and giving of our self and seeing a need in the church and stepping up and filling that gap, wouldn't it be wonderful you didn't have to drag someone into it? In my 40-some years of pastoring, one of the things that I didn't like at all is to need a Sunday school teacher and go to an individual, I'll do it if you can't find anybody else. I said, that's okay. I don't want you. I didn't say that to them, but I don't want them. If you're not in this with your heart, if you're not into this with your soul, if this is not what you want to do to be a servant of the living Christ, friend, you're going to be a hindrance. Now, I know I'm not going to get shouted down on this point. But listen to me tonight. Don't we need the mind of Christ to be of a measure, Lord, I may not be the best, I may not be, can do anything much, but if there's no one else to do it, I'll do something. The Lord must have put that in my heart as an early Christian because after we got saved, it wasn't long until they asked me to fill in at the church where I was saved at. And I said, well, I'm not called to preach. But I said, I'll pray about it. I said, I could go and, and keep the doors open. I can go and read scripture I can go and conduct a service, but I'm not a preacher at that point. And I said, let me pray about it. And I felt like the Lord would be pleased if we went over there and started filling in. And we did for four years. <laughs> we filled in for four years. And during that four years, I got a call to preach. But I want you to know tonight, if there's a gap, if there's a void, if there's a need, friend, we ought to be of a mind to say, hey, let me do what I can. Someone more advanced and someone more capable comes along. Here, brother, step in here. It's not about positions or power. It's about the kingdom. And Christ was looking out for the welfare of the kingdom and the welfare of the church. His mind was sacrificial. You know it was. I don't need to give you illustrations of that. You know his self-denial goes beyond anything we know about. We don't know about sleeping out under the stars on a rock for a pillow. and We don't know about walking everywhere we go. We don't know about that. But Jesus gave sacrificially even down to giving his own life. Thirdly, I talked to you about a steadfast mind. How, how would that help us, preacher, if I'm not constantly up and down? Well, you'd be consistent. If you have a mind that is steadfast, if you have a mind of Christ, he never wavered, friends. From the 12 years of age, when he sat in the temple talking to the doctors of the law and showing them things out of the word of God, and his mother said, how, where have you been, son? We've, we've missed you. How could you do this? I must be about my father's business. He wasn't talking about Joseph. He knew who his father was. His mind was made up. His gaze was steadfast. His heart was set. His will was set to do the will of God and to finish the mission that he had come here to accomplish. Would that help the Christian church world today? 
have all that settled real good. I know where I'm going. I know what I need to be doing. I'm going to be at the business of it. I'm not going to tarry. I'm not going to lay around and be lazy about it. I'm going to get busy. Jesus had a steadfast mind to do the will of God, and we need that steadfastness. We need it desperately. We need to be more bold to proclaim the truth and never compromise the word. We need to be of the persuasion. And Jesus said things that offended people. In fact, it got so hot one time, he looked at his disciples. When the rest of the crowd was turning away from him, he said, will you go away also? Do these words offend you? Now, they didn't understand it. They didn't comprehend it. But the words that he was speaking to them were spiritual, not literal. Drink my blood, eat my flesh. Cannibalism? No, he wasn't teaching cannibalism. He was taking and spiritualizing his blood and his body was given for the church. There's a spiritual application there. And I trust the Lord will help us as we think about what God would want us to do and to realize that some positions that we take scripturally do offend people. Not everybody wants to do what God wants them to do and therefore Jesus said, if they hate me, they'll hate you too. What the church needs to do is rise above that in this day and say, I'm going to mind God. I'm going to leave the consequences with him. The consequences of my obedience belong to God. If I'm minding God and everybody in the world gets mad at me, the consequences belong to him as long as I know 100% this is what he told me to do and I'm doing it the way he told me to do it. Now we can get on ourselves, we can get out on ourselves in the arm of the flesh and we can make a mess of things in a hurry and that, in that case it's on you, it's not on him. But if you do his will, his way, the consequences of your obedience belong to God. I want a steadfast mind. I want a confident mind. I don't want to be fearful to talk about God. I don't want to be fearful to stand up. and I don't want to be ashamed of him in this wicked and, and perverse generation. Do you? I want to be standing up for God. I'm not ashamed to go out in public the way we dress. I'm not ashamed for my wife to go out in public the way we dress. Why? Because I believe this is the way God wants us to do it. And we're, we have this confidence because we know we have settled our lifestyle issues on the word of God. Not on some man's theory, not on some man's creed, but on the word of God. If your life is patterned after the word of God, friend, you can go on with a confident spirit knowing that God is going to bless you. Not everybody will bless you, but God will. So let me add to these four tonight uh, a couple or three more. I'll, I'll go quick. Uh, a compassionate mind. Would I need to take you through the scriptures to realize that Christ had compassion on those he ministered to? Would I need to take you to Jerusalem as he wept over the city? Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how many times I would have taken you as a hen doth her chicks, gathered you unto myself. He wept over Jerusalem. He wept at the grave of Lazarus. He looked at the crowd after preaching to them all day. We get a little upset if it goes over an hour. He had preached to them all day long, taught them all day long. They hadn't had breakfast. If they did, they got it before they got there. They hadn't had lunch, and supper wasn't anywhere in sight. And Jesus, I have compassion on this crowd. Give them something to eat. And the disciples, well, how in the world are we going to feed this crowd out of here? It would take 200 penny worth of bread to satisfy so that everybody would have a little bit. Jesus said, give me what you got. <laughs> That's all he needs is what we have to offer for him to bless it and multiply it, church, so that he can feed the multitude as long as we're looking on them with compassion. Jesus looked on the crowd. He looked at the leper with compassion and even reached out and touched him. So much against the rules of his day. So much against even caution. He threw caution to the wind. Leprosy is a very contagious disease. Jesus reached out and touched the leper. I like the phrase the leper used, if thou wilt, thou canst make me clean. I like to come to Jesus that way with my petition, if thou wilt, thou can meet this need. You know, I don't want to get the answer of the leper, God, don't you? I will 
be thou clean. And immediately his leprosy dried up. Wouldn't it be wonderful if we had the mind of Christ that we could have pity on people that are suffering? Wouldn't it be wonderful if we could have pity on people that are lost, people that are hungry? We need the mind of Christ, folks. We need this compassion to bring back a spirit of soul winning, a spirit of evangelism. As long as we look at them with disgust and disdain, and I understand how that's easy to do, because we're against most of what they're for, right? We stand diametrically opposed to what the world is advocating. But somehow, Christ managed to love them anyway. God help us. There would be some real benefit tonight in having a compassionate spirit. You know, people understand that. You can say words, God bless you, be ye filled. When he's hungry and give him nothing to eat, he understands all you give him was a lot of hot air. Be ye warmed and filled, but you gave him nothing to warm him or fill him with. But what would it be if you took him a loaf of bread and a pound of bologna and a pack of cheese and or whatever, took him down to the local restaurant and bought him a hot meal. And, and I realize there's a lot of crooks out there. After being pastoring for so long, we dealt with a lot of them that come through. And all they were looking for was a handout from the church. They were looking to take from the church. I had one family get so upset at me, he really cussed and, and ran off with his tires squealing. He wanted some money for food. He had his family in there, and he did have kids in there. And I said, listen... Church is getting ready to start, sir. If you and your family will come in and sit through the service this morning, my wife is an excellent cook. We'll bring you and your family over to the parsonage. We'll give you a hot meal and put you on your way. I can't stay. I've got to go. Well, are you hungry or in a hurry? He was in a hurry. He wanted our money to run. I said, well, sir, listen, if you can't stay 45 minutes or an hour and listen to a gospel message in exchange for a meal for five people, I can't help you. So was that hard? I had compassion on him. I was going to feed him. I was going to feed him two ways if he'd let me. I was going to talk to his soul and minister to the spiritual needs that his family had, and then I was going to take him and let him eat of our groceries. Friend, we need to have a compassionate spirit. We need to have a desire to help these people. But realize there's boundaries to not be taken advantage of, but yet not lose all compassion when it comes to this ungodly generation. Lord, help me. I want the mind of Christ so that I can be compassionate. That we can see people the way he sees them. He sees them as souls. I've got a dear brother that's been under such a tremendous burden of late. He'll text me in the middle of the night, weeping and praying and texting and said, oh, I can't hardly live to think that all these people in South Korea and all these people in these other far-flung places of the world, he said, they're going to die and go to hell, and I can't seem to get anything done to change that. Friend, we need a burden for souls, but we have to love them. We have to want to see them into the kingdom. That would be an excellent reason to pray this way. Lord, give me the mind of Christ. Help me to love them as you love them. Help me to sympathize and empathize the way you did. And reach out and extend yourself. You know, even the lady that Jesus seemed to be mean to, and people don't understand that scripture where this, I think it was a Syrophoenician woman had a daughter that had a demon. You remember the scripture? And she came and asked the Lord to cast the demon out, and he said, uh, I can't be giving the children's food to the dogs. That seems kind of harsh, doesn't it? That was, that was saying what the Jewish culture and mindset of the day would have said. But she didn't give up. She didn't relent. She come back with a good answer. Lord, the dogs eat from the crumbs of the master's table. He saw a faith there that he could not turn away from. And I'm not sure he was going to anyway. This might have been just to try her faith to see how badly she wanted help for her daughter. If her pride had gotten in the way, if she'd have gotten insulted and got puffed up and got angry and started cursing him, her daughter would never have gotten better, would it? 
But Jesus had a love and compassion for many people. Compassionate spirit, compassionate mind. And then I, I think this is really a good one. Is he had a merciful mind, a merciful attitude, a forgiving spirit. Did he not? All we'd have to do is look at Calvary, wouldn't we? Kill him, Father. Did he say that? Send the angels and slay this bunch of barbarians that have hung me on a tree, whipped me almost to death, spit in my face. Father, wipe them out. He didn't say that. He didn't say that at all. I don't believe he even thought that. But what he did say was, Father, forgive them. For they know not what they do, what they do. And I think, church, as we center more on getting the mind of Christ, we'll be a more merciful people. We'll be a more forgiving people. So those people didn't apologize. No, they didn't, but he forgave them anyway. Those people weren't sorry for what they did. No, they weren't, but he forgave them anyway. They didn't deserve being forgiven. No, they didn't, but he forgave them anyway. The mind of Christ. Someone has said that hatred ends at Calvary. You been to Calvary? You can't hate anybody. With maybe one exception. I'll allow you to hate the devil. Other than that, you can't hate anyone. You can't hate your brother, you can't hate your sister, you can't help hate family members that done you wrong, can't hate business people that done you wrong, can't hate anybody. Because the mind of Christ was of such a forgiving nature that he taught his disciples to forgive 70 times 7. And if he would have taught us to do that, would he have done less? Never. Never would he have done less. If absolute forgiveness is the standard, and it must be because he said, if you don't forgive me in their trespasses, neither will your father forgive you yours. So that makes it kind of a, a, a dead wind for us if we'll get the mind of Christ and become merciful and realize that forgiveness is the only course for a Christian. There is no other course of action but forgive them. Do it instantly. Do it quickly. So the burden and the grudge and the poison don't begin to poison your system. Do it instantly when someone wrongs you. Forgive them. Amen. Amen. Yep. What would be the benefit of that mind? Stop a lot of fusses, wouldn't it? Someone said it takes two to fight. I think it does. If one of them doesn't want to fight and doesn't agree to fight, then the fight's over. I forgive you. I don't want to be forgiven. I forgive you anyway. Huh? He said, that's easier said than done, preacher. Yes, it is. But that's why grace has been provided for you and for me by the Spirit of God that indwelt Christ. That same Spirit indwells us. And friend, we can have the mind of Christ. I want the Spirit of Christ. Philippians 1, 27b says that you stand fast in one spirit with one mind striving against each other for the faith of the gospel. Does that sound right to you? I know you're not there maybe. That's not what it says. He said stand fast in one spirit with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel. In chapter 2, verse 2, Paul says again, Fulfill ye my joy, that ye be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. 1 Peter 3, 8 and 9, Finally, be ye all of one mind, having compassion one of another. Love as brethren, be pitiful, be courteous, not rendering evil for evil or railing for railing, but contrarywise blessing, knowing that ye are thereunto called that ye should inherit a blessing. One of the greatest benefits of having the mind of Christ would be the unity that would come in the body of Christ. Stop and think about this. We've all got our own mind. Right? We've got our mind. And we've got our thoughts. And we've got our feelings. 
And we got our preconceived ideas of how things ought to be done, right? And all of those are different. And when all of those are different and there comes to a decision that has to be made in a certain area, then we're voting according to our mind. And that brings a division. That brings a discord. But if all of us would pursue the mind of Christ until it's what do you want, Lord? And how many times do people pray that before a board meeting, before a vote, before a, a a big decision in their life. How many people actually get down and say, Father, if this is your will, I want it. If not, I don't want it. I want to know your will. I want to know the mind of Christ, in other words. And so, friend, unity would be the greatest benefit of the church world getting in earnest about trying to secure the attitudes that Christ carried and the mind that he carried and allow him to direct us and guide us in our, in our daily affairs, plus in our interactions together, church splits would be over if we all sought the mind of Christ because he would not be in, in discord with any of himself. And the body of Christ could come together as one over and over. The Bible talks about being in one accord. They were there on the day of Pentecost in the upper room. They were all in one accord. What does that mean? They were in unity. They were in harmony. There was not contention. There was not disagreement. There was a coming together and a oneness of the body of Christ. And the result was the Holy Spirit was poured out on the church. I believe it would happen again. If we all really said, Lord, what do you want about this? Brother or sister so and so and I have disagreed about this. Well, what do you want about it? And if the Lord shows you you, would wrong, you were wrong, would you go back and say, hey, sister, hey, brother, I've been praying about this that we talked about, and I feel like God showed me I was wrong. How much would that do to bring revival in our churches? But we need his mind. We need his mind. Because we need that unity. The only way we can get closer to the heart, mind, and, the, and be a better Christian in the spirit of Christ is to be able to some way have him impart to us his spirit, his mind. And, and if sanctification will go a great ways in making that possible. But friend, it's still a matter of disciplining ourselves to seek his face, to turn to him for wisdom. You know, I like that scripture. He said, Guy, if any man lacketh wisdom, let him ask of God, who giveth to all men liberally and upbraideth not. But he said something else about that wisdom. He says it's pure. The wisdom that comes from God is pure. It's peaceable. In other words, it's harmonious. It's easy to be entreated. It's full of good fruits. That's the wisdom that God imparts. The wisdom that we have usually stirs up a fuss. Someone could say amen. It does. Because my wisdom is not your wisdom. And my thoughts are not your thoughts. But we need to some way concentrate on this enough to say, Lord, these, there's some great benefits. There would be some great benefits to me spiritually to have more of your mind and your spirit and your attitude and your feelings working through me. Lord, can you transform me? Can you help me? The Bible gives us three minds, and I'm closing. It's 8 o'clock. The natural mind, which is an unsaved person, man or woman, boy or girl. The natural man, Paul tells us in Corinthians, receiveth not the things of God. Okay, Unsaved, you're not going to get it. You're not going to get it. It's not going to make sense. Engineer from U.S. Steel, smart man. I read the Bible, Roger, and I don't get anything out of it. The natural man, smart man. But he didn't get anything because the word of God is spiritual. The word of God comes by revelation, not by uh, any intellectual collection of our own. But we realize tonight that the natural man doesn't get it. So if you're here tonight unsaved and you want to know more about the mind of Christ, the first thing to do is be born again. Come to God in faith and repentance and get saved. Then the Bible talks about the carnal mind. That's the mind that James says is double-minded. Maybe Christ lives in the heart, but you're not yet sanctified. The carnal mind, the fleshly mind is still in enmity with God and it is 
To be carnally minded, the Bible says, is death. It'll kill what spiritual life you have. If you don't go on and get rid of the carnal mind, that, that mind that's divided, that mind that wants what it wants, if it goes along with what God wants, great. If God wants something it doesn't want, then God's going to be out. Carnal mind. The unsanctified mind. But then there's the spiritual mind. The spiritual man that's saying yes to God. Saying yes to God in every area of their life. Saying, Lord, I want more of your will. I want more of your way to see. I want more light, more love, more grace, more, more compassion, more consistency in my life, more steadfastness, more spiritual confidence, Lord, that I can stand up and boldly proclaim I'm redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. His child and forever I am. Are you redeemed tonight? Do you want to be steadfast? Do you want to be self-denying? Do you want to be sacrificial? Do you want to be a servant? Do you want to call him master in prayer? Can you honestly call him master? I like to refer to him as master. And I tell people I'm a willing slave. Because I'll go wherever he wants me to go. I'll do whatever he wants me to do. I settled it a long time ago. And I'm too far from where I started. Now think about changing courses tonight, aren't you? This is a good way, folks. But it's an ever-growing way. It's, this is not a stagnant. It's not something you just get in, you sign the membership card, that's good, I pay my dues once a week, give my offering, I'm good. That's not it. This is a walk with God. This is a walk of life-changing power. And as you obey the Scriptures and walk in the light, you will grow in grace. And you'll grow in the knowledge of Jesus Christ. What a privilege tonight to know more about him and to be more like him in our daily lives. We've met some of these dear old saints, and I'm over three minutes, I've got to quit. But uh, some of these dear old saints that are so sweet, they're just, they're just so sweet, so sanctified, so, so meek, so humble, and yet so boisterous and, and full of joy and full of the grace of God and uh, you think they got there overnight? They didn't. They went through the trials you're going through now. But they settled it to be what God wanted them to be. They settled it to stay true to Christ. They settled it to let God have the final yes or the final no. I want the mind of Christ. Shall we stand?